Resuming debate, reprise du débat, the Honourable Member for Desnate, Mississippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to be splitting my time tonight with the member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, in 2019, my pitch to voters in northern Saskatchewan was that I would take my experience as an accountant, a multi-term mayor, and a Crown Corporation chair, and that I would take these experiences to Ottawa and represent the people of northern Saskatchewan to the best of my ability. In my relatively short time of service, I've said on many occasions to those around me, that if I were to have run my business like this government governs, I would have been bankrupt a long time ago. If I had shown the same contempt for my elected council as this Liberal government has for the elected members of this House, I would have had a mutiny and would definitely not have survived multiple terms as mayor. Over the past several months, the Liberals have shown a pattern of leaving things till the midnight hour and then essentially holding Parliament hostage to get their legislation passed. We have seen four examples of this, one in March, two in April, and one in July. When I wrote this, little did I know how true the midnight hour comment would be, as we see, in fact, this literally playing out tonight. Now here we are on September 29th, and the government is looking for approval for over $50 billion in spending, with very limited time to either scrutinize it or for us to offer suggestions as ways to improve it. Each time this has happened, Mr. Speaker, the line was always, we must do this quickly or else. Each time it meant there was no time for scrutiny and we should just trust them. They know what's best for Canadians. They do not need feedback from Canada's elected representatives in this House because they got this. Mr. Speaker, announcing these proposed measures the day after shutting down Parliament and then waiting until after CERB ended to, in to introduce the legislation seems a little suspicious to me. We definitely do not need any committee work on this. After all, committees are a bit of a thorn in the side of this Prime Minister, aren't they? I don't know if you see a pattern here, Mr. Speaker, but I do. Mr. Speaker, there's a second pattern here that, that's, that's not just about this, but it's about timing as well. There's a pattern where a lack of oversight and transparency is desired by this government, and it goes back further than the pandemic. On my very first experience as an MP, I was asked to participate in a Committee of the Whole proceeding on December the 9th, 2019, where we were asked to scrutinize over $4.9 billion in a mere four hours. My first reaction was, seriously? In my role as the mayor of my little city, we spent many hours and even days scrutinizing, scrutinizing the spending. And I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, we were not dealing with numbers of this magnitude. Let me fast forward a little bit. I will never forget at the beginning of the pandemic when the government attempted to give themselves unfettered powers to December 31st, 2021 by slipping in the very first emergency legislation, these powers. You can call me naive if you like, Mr. Speaker, but I could not believe that any elected official would have the nerve to try to pull something like this. I asked myself over and over again in the days following, who was crass enough to think that this was somehow a good idea and that it would fly. The Liberals clearly have an issue with any kind of openness and transparency. Mr. Speaker, the old saying goes, actions speak louder than words. May I be as bold as to suggest that a little more scrutiny may actually have prevented some of the scandals we're seeing? Maybe, may I be as bold as to suggest that a little more consultation up front and better parliamentary process might have led to, for example, Indigenous businesses being included in the original business supports like Seuss and Seba, instead of being added only as an afterthought when they were left out in the original legislation. This is the relationship that the Prime Minister likes to repeatedly say is the most important one to his government. If that is in fact so, why did it take weeks of pressure and lobbying to have Indigenous-owned limited partnerships included in Seuss? Why did it take months for Indigenous businesses to have access to a version of SEBA when a little consultation would have clearly identified that the original version would not work for them as the, they do not utilize traditional banks. Mr. Speaker, the same point could be made about many small businesses and, own, and farmers as well. A little consultation would have easily determined that there was going to be a significant problem preventing many of them from accessing SEBA as well. 
This literally took months to resolve, leaving many fearing for their ability to survive. My colleague, the member from Thornhill, in his speech yesterday shared some very wise words, and I think they're worth repeating, so I'm going to quote one paragraph. He said, the COVID crisis is not just a health crisis. The COVID, COVID has taken a terrible toll on our Canadian economy as it has with economies around the world. Canada today has the highest unemployment rate in the G7, despite having almost the highest spending in the G7. With the amendment to Bill C-4 now before us today, Canada's deficit and debt would soar to historic record new levels. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I asked the people of my riding a question on social media. I asked them what I should say to this government when I had an opportunity to speak today. The number one answer was, what is the plan for all this spending? Then they added, when I take out a loan, the lender wants to know how I will pay it back, along with many other criteria. It's an interesting concept, isn't it, Mr. Speaker? A plan. What a novel concept. The answer I'm giving to the people of my constituency is that I don't believe there is a plan. There is no plan to ever balance the budget, yet alone repay any of the debt incurred. Former Saskatchewan NDP Finance Minister Janice McKinnon co-chairs the C.D. Howe Institute on the, sorry, the C.D. Howe Institute's Fiscal and Tax Working Group with former Liberal Finance Minister John Manley. In a recent report, they urged the federal government to set limits on spending and to ensure that when spending is approved, it is truly necessary and contributes to Canada's longer-term productivity. Sounds like a plan. In a recent Globe and Mail article, economics reporter David Parkinson shared some very interesting thoughts with us. He talked about the misery that was the second quarter of 2020. He talked about the lost quarter. He then referenced an 11.5% plunge in gross domestic product, which is the worst quarter-to-quarter -quarter decline ever. Millions of Canadians are out of work, more than doubling the pre-pandemic unemployment rate. Yet in the midst of all this, Canadians' incomes actually grew. Details contained in the last quarterly gross domestic product report reveal that household disposable income in Canada surged by 11% in the second quarter. That obviously left, led to the question, where did this surprising income explosion come from? It certainly wasn't wages, because they tumbled by almost 9%. The answer, Mr. Speaker, is the federal government crisis income supports that more than filled that income hole. The employment compensation in our country was reduced by $21 billion, but disposable income went up by $54 billion in government transfers. That's astounding, Mr. Speaker. This tells us that the government response has gone way beyond the goal of simply replacing lost income. Now, Mr. Speaker, let me be really clear. Some will take my comments to say that I do not believe that some of the extraordinary emergency funding has been needed and continues to be needed to support Canadians in their time of need. Nothing could be further from the truth. Any compassionate and just society has a moral obligation to help people in their time of need. However, Mr. Speaker, I'm a little bit dismayed by the lack of transparency and accountability displayed by this government. I am dismayed by the unacceptable snub of Parliament, by the time lost during the unnecessary shutdown for all to consider, debate, and more reasonably determine some outcomes. I am dismayed by the constant rush to ram legislation through this House when, in fact, the rush is simply one of partisan, self-serving survival. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I am dismayed by the lack of a plan. What is the plan for our future that I can take back and share with the residents of northern Saskatchewan? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question. Comments? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and there is a plan. That's one of the reasons why the session was prorogued. You know, there's, there's a document called the Throne Speech that was released on September the 23rd, just last week, Mr. Speaker. There's 20, 32 pages on the English side uh, which details a plan, not only for days, but weeks and months and possibly going years, years into the future. M Mr. Speaker, more and more we get Conservatives standing up, expressing their reservations in terms of we are spending too much. And the question has got to be asked of many of those Conservatives, because that's the contrast between us and the Conservative Party. We believe that we need 
to support Canadians at a time of need, whether they are seniors and the member across the way with whose money? We're talking about the tax dollars. We're talking about deficit, yes. But I can tell you that today we need to invest and support Canadians. Their health and their well-being and our economy dictates the government gets engaged. My question to the member is, does he not agree that if the government of Canada did not get, into, get engaged into the degree in which it has and worked with the different provinces and other stakeholders, would he not agree that the impact on our country would have been far more devastating? The Honourable Member for Desnate, Mississippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the speech with the short question at the end. First, let, let me make it very clear, Mr. Speaker. As I said in my comments, any compassionate society and its leaders have a, a moral obligation and responsibility to care for those in need. But from the stories that I'm hearing from the people in my riding, they are very, very concerned about the level of support that has been offered. When we talk $33 billion in one quarter in excess of the lost wages, we have gone way beyond the goal of replacing income. Mr. Speaker, I have four kids. They have three spouses, one significant other, and my first grandchild. That's 11 of us. Mr. Speaker, my family in this current year of government spending, not including some of the new stuff that will happen over the coming months, means that my family of 11 people has taken on $110,000 of new debt. That terrifies me for my grandchildren, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? L'honorable député de Saint-Jean. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague from Nusnifi Churchill for his speech, especially regarding the role of parliamentarians during a debate. We can agree with the principle of C4, but we know that the devil is in the details. There will be significant impacts that will result from this bill, which will last perhaps up to a year. It impacts workers, but also businesses and the reopening of the economy. The NDP has supported uh, shutting down uh, Parliament, and so we couldn't continue asking questions about we charity, and now we have to uh, rush through a bill that will that is supposed to support people, workers, and others, and businesses, and we won't be able to study it fully because of the time restraints. Is my colleague in agreement with me? Uh, there's an affront to our voters as well, the Canadians we represent. Bill River. Um, I want to thank my colleague for her, her question. I apologize. I'll answer in English as I, as I don't speak French um, yet. I'm working on it. Okay? Um, I, I think I would agree 100% with my colleague's comments. I mean, this, this is a massive change to the Labour Code. Um, in many ways, we're concerned kind of about a conflict with provincial jurisdictions, employers, boards of trade, chambers of commerce. None of these people were engaged. None of these people were consulted. And this gets put before us to pass in a very short time frame under a bunch of pressure at the 11th hour. Um, I, I would 100% agree that, that there's some really, really deep concerns when we, when we talk about the Wee scandal. We talk about one of the comments that I've consistently made about that is, is I'm so afraid that all we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. When we've spent hundreds of billions of dollars in a short time frame, how many other wee scandals are under the surface? Resuming debate, reprise du débat, the Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to be able to participate in this.